This lecture will focus on the practice of and research supporting active management of the third stage of labor. The acronym used for this is AMTSL, and the intervention refers to the third stage of labor, so just after the birth of the baby. And I'll refer to it here as active management. Active management decreases the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. We know this. Varney reviews recent data from a meta-analysis that compared active management to physiologic management. Physiologic is also known as expectant management, and this is when medications are given only if bleeding is excessive or doesn't stop with fundal massage or other non-pharmaceutical methods. Active management significantly reduced blood loss greater than 500 milliliters and reduced the need for additional uterotonic medications. That's the overview, read more in Varney, about each study. Now, based on the current evidence, there are three elements to active management of third stage labor. The first is gentle cord traction, which facilitates birth of the placenta. The second is a uterotonic medication, commonly Pitocin, either through an existing IV or via an IM injection. And the third is fundal massage after birth of the placenta. And the third, fundal management, is recommended by ICM and FIGO. Now, historically, early cord clamping was the fourth element, but this is no longer recommended based on the known neonatal benefits of delayed cord clamping. So additionally, cord traction is only recommended if practiced by a skilled birth attendant due to the risk of uterine inversion and cord avulsion. So those are the three. A note about uterotonics and active management. So the use of a uterotonic medication is the most essential component of active management. The medication, the route, the timing is still debated, and no clear evidence has emerged, although you'll find that 10 units of Pitocin, intramuscular, or IV is the most commonly used medication during active management. So let's talk about the timing. When do we give it? Guidelines generally refer to Pitocin administration after the birth of the newborn. However, it can be given at the birth of the anterior shoulder, during the birth of the neonate, through the birth canal, after the shoulder, or after the birth of the placenta. The overall goal is to ensure that the uterotonic is given following the birth of the infant and not in the event of a shoulder dystocia. So you want to make sure that birth is actually occurring. There is no clinical evidence of placental entrapment if Pitocin is given before placental expulsion. And this has been debated, and now we know, based on evidence, this to be true. So the alternative management option to active management that we spoke of before is physiologic or expectant management, which includes no routine uterotonic and only gentle, if any, umbilical cord traction. It also includes delayed cord clamping, just as active management does. Now, your Varney text notes that there are multiple studies that suggest no significant dif difference in the risk for severe postpartum hemorrhage among women who received physiologic management compared to active management, if they are low risk for postpartum hemorrhage. However, in the case of a postpartum hemorrhage, especially in a low resource setting, active management is recommended, as follow-up interventions to medications are not usually present in low resource settings or available. Take a look at the table in Varney titled Comparison of Physiologic and Active Management Approaches to Management of the Third Stage of Labor. Now, what is mixed management? Mixed management refers to the use of some components of active management, but not all. And it's fairly common, as many of you working in labor and delivery areas already know, or will come to know during your interpartum rotations. So perhaps a uterotonic is given, but gentle cord traction is not, and fundal massage is not, etc. Now, uterotonics. Again, a note on which is preferred. So Pitocin, and then what? Pitocin is the preferred uterotonic in active management, but it may not be as effective in those women who received large amounts of Pitocin during their labor for either induction or labor augmentation. So second-line prophylactics available in the U.S. include ergot alkaloids or prostaglandins. Now miso, misoprostol, is not as effective as a postpartum prophylactic during active management, but it can be used if others are not available, and it's very easy to get and low cost. The use of herbs and homeopathic remedies to reduce postpartum hemorrhage risk should be studied further. Now, a note on cord traction, this element of active management. Cord traction should not be performed without guarding the uterus, 
as this maneuver may result in an avulsed cord or inverted uterus, and we practice this at intensives. So gentle cord traction is an important part of active management, and it's used to facilitate expulsion of the placenta through the maternal birth passage following its release from the maternal uterine wall. Now keep in mind that delayed cord clamping and cord traction can be done in tandem by using perhaps a 4x4 four four gauze square wrapped around the cord near the mother's perineum to allow the midwife traction on the cord because it can be very slippery with gloves on the cord directly. And you wouldn't want to place cord clamps on a cord as that will inhibit the blood flow and therefore no longer be considered delayed cord clamping. Another important note is that cord traction is often not necessary and it can increase the risk of uterine inversion for women in upright positions, especially during birth of the placenta. Women in upright positions can often feel an urge once the placenta has detached from the uterine wall, slides into the maternal pelvis, and is sitting on the pelvic floor. Women can then bear down and gently birth without any cord traction. So fundal massage. And when we talk about fundal massage as a component of active management, keep in mind that this is external uterine massage. We're not internally doing anything. Fundal massage is the third component of active management, and it includes external uterine massage after the placenta has been birthed. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The practice is recommended by ICM, and again, this is the International Confederation of Midwives, and FIGO, which is the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. However, as Varney notes, the precise benefit of fundal massage is undetermined. And based on one RCT, and you can read more about this in Varney, it was found that when a uterotonic was used, there may be no additional benefit from external fundal massage, and it's very uncomfortable for women. Now, fundal massage prior to placental expulsion is never recommended. That can cause incomplete placental separation and increases the risk of resulting postpartum hemorrhage. All right, let's do a quick case study on active management. So we have a G4P3 who had a postpartum hemorrhage of 1,100 milliliters with her previous baby and is now in the antepartum period requesting Pitocin only if necessary. She wants that written in her chart. She is open to IV placement upon admission and labor. Now, what does shared decision-making look like in this case? What does informed consent look like? The idea of active management, especially as a nurse midwife now, as opposed to a labor nurse, is that we have access to these clients in the antepartum period. And that means that educating women and families about the risk of postpartum hemorrhage and the many interventions that we have to treat it is a key component of midwifery care. What we also need to add is what we can do prophylactically to decrease the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. And this means, as opposed to waiting for, for blood loss and postpartum hemorrhage, we prophylactically offer active management of third stage based on the evidence and the studies. However, women have uh, the option, of course, and through shared decision making, as long as they know the risks and are fully educated and have a chance to ask and have their questions answered, they can opt out of this or should be able to. However, that does place a woman at risk. And based on that, it should be clearly noted in her antepartum chart uh, what she desires and also have her answered questions on the antepartum. Is she aware that if she bleeds, she could, bl she could have a postpartum hemorrhage that could result in loss of life or loss of her uterus? As long as she's aware of these things and not in an intimidating fashion, but certainly through shared decision making, this should be allowed. Now, what's the difference, again, between shared decision making and informed consent? Reminder that informed consent can be a piece of paper that's given to a woman sitting alone in a room reading about the risks and benefits of certain procedures. And in this case, it could be the risks of not receiving active management and the risks of having a postpartum hemorrhage. She signs, that's informed consent. Shared decision-making is different. It's perhaps giving her that form to read about the risks and then sitting down with a provider to ask those questions. What are the statistics? What are the alternatives? What have you seen in practice? What would you recommend based on the research? Where can I find more research? What research are you reading? What out there might give me incomplete evidence and I would be making the wrong decision based on the wrong evidence, etc.? How do I know what's quality? You know, a blog versus um, an RCT. Based on that and the giving and receiving of information on both sides, right? So I'm giving information and education. I'm receiving information about her values and preferences. And based on that, we come to a decision together. It may not be the one that I would select, but it's the one that she selects. And it's based on shared decision making. In this case, we know with a history of postpartum hemorrhage, she is at risk of another hemorrhage, likely one that's even greater than the 1100 she had before. And that should be discussed. 
I hope that's helpful. Active management is something that you should be discussing with all clients in antepartum visits, especially in that third trimester, and make sure their families are aware as well. Many of them have questions as medications are delivered following the birth of the babe, so families shouldn't be surprised by this. I hope you all are well and enjoyed. Any questions, please post them in the general discussion forum for clarification. Have a great day. 